Do the climate scientists at NOAA fake the data for US temperatures to turn an actual cooling trend into a fake warming trend? Let's have a look. My name's Malin Baker. This is The Malin Baker Show for Changemakers. If you watch any number of videos by climate skeptic Tony Heller, you'll be familiar with this sequence. These adjustments turn a century-long strong cooling trend into a warming trend. These very specific graphs come up quite a lot. And since I've done a couple of video responses to Tony Heller videos, I'm often asked, sometimes with genuine interest and curiosity, and sometimes as a more hostile challenge to attempt the impossible, if I would do a video about whether or not these claims that the data is being faked are correct. Since Tony Heller released a couple more on this theme very recently, and the case he makes seems to be a very compelling one, I thought that now would be the time to have a closer look. I've done several videos looking at the best skeptics' arguments on climate change, and I've tried to approach those exercises with a blank slate and an open mind to see what comes out. It's looking for the best evidence, not just going in with a mindset to prove one side or the other. Now, I'm absolutely willing to adopt the same mindset to ask the question whether or not the adjustments made are valid and whether they incorrectly give a misleading result. That's a question about the validity of data processing and choices in how things get corrected or not. However, Tony Heller goes 10 steps further than this, and he repeatedly makes statements where he mind reads the scientific community and attributes malicious intent. When NOAA and NASA tamper with temperature data like they do, they are destroying US history and destroying world history too. And then their data tampering is the basis of propaganda like this article. We see these fake articles being put out day after day, which form the foundation of climate alarmism. And then climate alarmism becomes the basis of policy. The small group of people at NASA and NOAA who are doing this data tampering are not data scientists, and they're not qualified to be working with this data set. They lack the necessary skills, and they have a fundamental conflict of interest. The people who are tampering with the data are climate modelers. They want to see a certain specific result, and by altering the data, they are getting the result they want to see. When considering this as an exercise, it's hard to ignore the fact that the one proposition, that the data adjustments give a misleading impression, and the second proposition, that this is the result of deliberate fraud, do not carry the same starting credence. Specifically because fraud is a major accusation, in this case being aimed at a wide range of unnamed professionals, and Heller offers no evidence whatsoever to support it as a motivating factor. All he does is to repeat the basic assertion over and over and over again, taking its truth as being self-evident. Now that can be very effective in persuading the uncritical. Indeed, research has shown since the late 1970s that simply repeating a proposition continuously trains the brain to believe it to be true. And that especially applies to people within your own identified group, where you start being friendly to the spirit of a proposition. But in the absence of evidence, repetition doesn't turn it into a respectable claim. As they say, claims without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. Because, well look, I've had a good dialogue with some of the more thoughtful sceptics who have raised more sophisticated points of detail on this channel. And there is a real distinction between those who bring a smart and sceptical eye to the orthodoxy versus those who will go along with innuendo because they approach these things in a fairly uncritical and tribalistic way. But in any case, it doesn't matter too much because whether you accept that fraud proposition as a valid theory or not, the first three stages that I think we need to go through would be the same. When confronted with a graph that appears to show incorrect bias, the questions would be, one, is the graph used genuinely representative? Does it provide the proof that it says that it does? Two, what is the full rationale for the changes that are made to the figures? And three, does that rationale support the final results? Or is a conclusion that this is misleading? Is that claim justified? And OK, if we get to question three and we conclude that there is indeed a misleading process, then you can ask whether there's evidence of intent. But let's cross that bridge when we get to it. The core of Tony Heller's case is that the unadjusted raw data, which he presents as being the true thermometer data, is the most reliable. It's the real data. And he says that it shows a cooling trend. 
And if you compare that with the adjusted data, then you see that the latter creates more of a warming trend and that this is a statistically invalid conclusion. He uses the phrase fraud. We'll stick with statistically invalid for now. OK, first of all, we head to the NOAA website, which has a graphing function where you can select the parameters that you're looking at. This is NOAA's official site showing its own data. So if NOAA's data is wrong, it's the data we see here that is wrong. Now, the graph that Tony Heller uses is highly specific. It's just the land territory of the United States and its maximum temperatures starting in 1920. If we're talking about global warming, you'd think you'd start with global temperatures. It's the warming of the overall climate that's the issue of focus. NOAA and NASA say that global surface temperatures have increased by about 1.25 degrees centigrade in the last 120 years. How this plays out in individual countries or continents may or may not mirror the global trend. However, let's go with it. And it's quite interesting because when you first arrive at the NOAA site for US specific temperatures, you immediately see that the data goes back to 1895 and the original default is average temperature. And if we go to that default graph, average temperature for each year shows that the warming trend is clear. And you have to say that the period before 1920 makes that trend seem even clearer. There is a spike in the mid 1930s, which means that starting the graph later in the 1920s does have the effect of flattening the trend line more than it otherwise would if it started from 1895. What about if we move over to Tony Heller's preferred measure, that of maximum temperatures? There we see the spike in the 1930s is bigger, but there's still a clear trend. But wait, that's with the earlier period still in. Let's just take that out. And OK, that flattens the trend line quite a bit, but it's still demonstrably up. Often the graph that Tony uses is more specific, just for summer months. So let's narrow it down to just June to August. Now that's a much flatter line. And as you can see, the spike in 1934 is now for the first time the highest point in the graph. But it does seem that Tony Heller specifically selected the one variation that gives the flattest line to start with. I tried various other combinations, winter temperatures, higher trend, minimum temperatures, much higher trend. And we've already seen the average temperatures, higher trend, both for summer months and also for the full year average. There are some videos of his where the question of cherry picking certain data would be a discussion to have. But the focus here is the difference between adjusted and raw data. So although the selection here might give us a raw data trend line that is downwards and maybe not others do, Ultimately, it's the difference between the two that is the focus. Two questions that are relevant to this stage. The difference between these two graphs looks quite big, but these are graphs that are generated by Tony Heller himself. And so one relevant question is, how does Tony Heller produce his graphs? And the second is, what accounts for the difference, assuming that it really exists? It's an important question because by all accounts, Tony Heller doesn't produce his graphs in the way that the pros do. And even the other climate sceptics have been known to criticise him for how he does it. So for one thing, climate professionals tend to prefer focusing on graphs that measure temperature anomalies rather than absolute temperatures. You might think, well, how fake is that? Surely temperature is temperature. But it makes sense if you're trying to track temperatures over time. Why? Because temperatures can vary locally hugely. The lane that I live in, for instance, is it's a short lane, but as measured by the thermometer of my car, generally half a degree lower at the bottom of the lane than it is at the main part of the village, which is probably why when there's been snow, it melts at the bottom of my lane last. So temperatures are very different, but anomalies are much more widely spread. Anomalies are where you take a baseline, say on average temperatures recorded between 1950 and 1980, or the average temperatures across the whole of the 20th century. And then against that baseline, you measure what's happened to the temperature in relation to it, not in absolute terms. So in terms of my lane, you know, you have two different temperatures, but if the temperature has gone up by a degree, it will have gone up by a degree both locations, even though the temperature will actually be different. And there are other reasons why that becomes important if you're averaging out a, a large number of stations. Because then there's the question of how you average your temperatures out. Tony Hell has been criticised again by fellow sceptics as much as others for averaging his results across all the stations from the raw data. There's a number of problems with this. The location of stations, latitude and elevation may skew the results in ways that are not realistic. 
Let's take an example, one that's given by NASA on its own website. Supposing you have a weather station at the bottom of a mountain that was opened in 1880. Then in 1900, you open another station near the top of the mountain. Obviously, the temperature at the top and the bottom of the mountain are going to be very different. Simply averaging the two will now result in a significant apparent cooling taking place from 1900 onwards. That would be one problem, just for averaging all the stations. And it's not theoretical. According to climate scientist blogger Tamino, this is exactly what has happened with stations in the US with a shift over time of stations towards a higher latitude. In other words, the location of stations over time has shifted from warmer to cooler latitudes. Now, if you don't correct for that shift, then guess what? You get an artificial cooling effect. The other problem would also come from geographical spread and the effects of averages. Let's give a simple example of how this works. Suppose for the sake of argument we have three regions which experience quite different temperatures traditionally. And suppose we have one of those regions well served, 20 monitoring stations, but in the other two much less well so, just three stations each. Now you take the results from those stations and you average them all together the average is going to look pretty much the same as the temperature in the region with the largest number of stations. Just because there's so many more of them, the averages are just going to be skewed in their direction. Well, how would you deal with that? You might decide to break up the region in parts and then average each part separately. And then you can average across the gridded squares. That gives you a much better average of the whole. So this is the first challenge. Using figures produced the way Tony Heller produces them gives us unreliable results if we're looking for evidence of what's happened over a time series particularly. You think you're seeing more reliable data because it's raw and not mucked about with, but actually not. Zeke Hausfather laid this out in a 2014 blog post because this discussion has been going on for a very long time. Heller made two major errors in his analysis. First, he is simply averaging absolute temperatures rather than using anomalies. Absolute temperatures work fine if and only if the composition of the station network remains unchanged over time. If a composition does change, you will often find that stations dropping out will result in climatological biases in the network due to differences in elevation and average temperatures that don't necessarily reflect any real information on a month-to-month -month or year-to-year -year variability. His second error is not to use any form of spatial weighting, e.g. gridding, when combining station records. While the USHCN network is fairly well distributed across the US, it's not perfectly so, and some areas of the country have considerably more stations than others. Not gridding can also exacerbate the effect of station dropout when the stations that drop out are not randomly distributed. I've not seen it suggested that those inconsistencies alone are responsible for creating a difference that doesn't exist. So that still leaves us with a question about what changes are made when data is adjusted, the changes between the raw and the adjusted figures, and why. There are a number of different factors. Back in the 1990s was when the figures began to be adjusted to take account of certain documented non-climate biases caused by station moves. As I mentioned earlier, the temperature down my lane, half a degree lower than the temperature at the top, even short moves can make a significant difference. What's the best way to deal with that when it happens? Since we're interested in the trend over time, it's to identify the trend baselines for the two different instances and then line them up. And since the most modern and up-to-date equipment is seen as the most reliable, that's often been done by adjusting the historical data accordingly rather than the new data. Now, you can argue about that. It's a choice that has no impact on the outcome. But when you get these stories about crazy climate alarmists changing the past, that's what the authorities suggest is happening. Another routine thing that has to be accounted for is what's called time of observation bias. Most of these stations are operated by volunteers. Unpaid volunteers change their routines or they may have to be replaced because they can't do it anymore. And so the time of day that readings are taken may change. And in fact, in the US, there was a planned change, which I'll refer to later on. Obviously, it's a lot cooler in the morning than it is in the afternoon. The time that readings are taken are all a matter of record, so that's another aspect of bias that can be and has to be adjusted for. Then there are other aspects. I've seen some sceptics in the comments section of my videos argue that global warming is all because of the urban heat island effect. 
So many of the stations now have more buildings and concrete around them, and that raises the local temperature artificially. That effect is something that, again, the professionals have known about for quite some time. And it's another thing that they actively do, in fact, adjust for. And it's one of those interesting marks of inconsistency in the whole discussion. On the one hand, you get people saying that the data is unreliable because they don't account for this artificial bias. But then others point to the adjustments that are made precisely in order to account for that artificial bias. And they conclude that those adjustments are evidence of cooking the books. Which is all very well, some people say, but then why is it that the changes only ever seem to go one way? Why do they always make the warming trend more extreme? And it's a good question, but on investigation, it seems to be one that's based on incomplete information. Adjustments made for land station data do indeed tend to make the warming greater. But the ocean adjustments, and remember a lot more of the Earth's surface is ocean than land, tend to make it cooler. This is because the biggest change with ocean temperatures was the moving from collecting water for measurement from boats as opposed to making measurements from buoys. It turned out that the boats approach too often introduced unintended additional heat to the water at the point of measurement. But should there really be so much change in the US ground-based weather stations? Apparently more so than for a number of others. In the past, in the US, the thermometers were read more often in the afternoon, while now they're more often read in the morning. This was a deliberate change by the National Weather Service to improve precipitation measurements. Also, the equipment has changed. It used to be measured with liquid in glass thermometers. Nowadays, it's mostly made using electronic minimum maximum temperature systems or automated surface observing systems. These, on average, measure a lower temperature because they heat up less standing in the sun. This is a difference made particularly large for the maximum temperatures and for summer. And it's worth noting that when Tony Heller does his comparison graphs, as I mentioned before, very often he uses maximum temperature measures and if season specific summer months. Also on station moves. Nearly every single station in the US network has been moved at least once over the last century, with many having three or more distinct moves. Indeed, some of those moves have been significant. For instance, a significant number of weather stations are now located at airports. Here's a graph comparing the raw data from only the airport stations, which are shown in green, with the NASA adjusted land temperature results. As you can see, there was a big divergence in the past, around 1940 or so. But then something pretty obvious occurs to you. This data goes back to 1880. How many airports do we think there were in 1880? Obviously none. So all of those airport stations were moved. According to Berkeley Earth, there was a large-scale movement of temperature stations from urban rooftops to airports starting in 1940 or so. And you can see that reflected in the graph. So that degree of error bias would simply be mixing into your overall results if you don't adjust the data to make it consistent. If you put in the raw data from non-airport stations in the same exercise, you see a much stronger correlation. So that move alone, involving hundreds of stations, makes a huge difference. The thing is, for all the conspiracy theories about changes, when you look to each of the relevant authorities, you find that what they do is documented and public. For instance, NOAA makes adjustments and they document them and they test them. Here's a paper relating to suggestions, for instance, that time of observation bias corrections added spurious warming. The researchers checked the data and found that it was robust, peer-reviewed and published. And another looking at the impact of exposure conditions. One of the authors for this one was noted sceptic Anthony Watts, hardly a shill for the climate alarmist community. And if you want to investigate some of the impacts of unadjusted and adjusted figures and some of the factors that have gone into them, there are resources online that enable you to do that. This one, for instance, that station by station shows the graphs of raw data and where and what at least some of the discontinuities are. There are breaks where there was a station move and where there was another change, such as an equipment change. You can see then how that was resolved in the adjusted figures. For a process that some hold as evidence of fraud, it's one of the most transparent processes you could imagine. And this enables sceptics to look for themselves at the data and raise concerns if things seem not to be right. Which is exactly what's happened numerous times over the last decade and a half. 
For instance, in 2015, one critic looked at the data for a station in Paraguay and found that the adjusted figures were significantly being warmed. A clear case of climate fraud. Now, what the analysis shows is a number of data points failed quality control and two station moves, one just after 1970 and one just after 2005. For this station, the trend before the adjustments were made was minus 1.37 degrees centigrade per century. After quality control, it was 0.89 degrees centigrade per century. And after adjusting for the station moves, it was plus 1.36 degrees centigrade, which is a big warming shift. But if you consider that the same region for the same months, the trend is plus 1.37 degrees centigrade per century. And for the country, for the same months, it's 1.28 degree centigrade per century. So after the adjustments, the result is consistent with what would be expected for that region and for that country. As I was researching the history of all this, you came across similar stories time and time again. It was like one great big climate data whack-a-mole. There'd be a big accusation of how the figures were being faked. People would look into it. It would turn out there was no fraud. And then another one would pop up a different graph with a different claim. And NOAA have shown that they've been committed to getting this right. To check how well its adjustments work, NOAA set up a network of pristinely located temperature stations across the USA that they could use as a reference. The authors of the study for this explain, to help resolve uncertainties caused by reliance on the historical network, NOAA began setting up a US climate reference network starting in 2001. The Climate Reference Network includes 114 stations spaced throughout the US that are well sited and away from cities. They have three temperature sensors that measure every two seconds and automatically send in data via satellite uplink. The reference network is intended to give a good sense of changes in temperature going forward, largely free from the issues that have plagued the historical network. With more than a decade's worth of this pristine reference data available, the study authors were able to compare it to the raw and adjusted data. The US land temperature adjustments had the biggest impact on the trend from the 1950s to the 1990s because that's when there were changes in the time of day, where the measurements were recorded and in the technology used to take the temperatures. This is the graph of the average from the historical network mapped against the pristine reference network. And it's a pretty good match. So anyway, there's a pretty thorough account of the science and scepticism of climate temperature graphs. Now, for some, none of this makes any difference. Tony Heller said some time ago, the fact that they can provide theoretical justifications for data tampering tells us absolutely nothing about the correctness of what they are actually doing. But all that says is that when it comes to accusations without evidence of conspiracy, ultimately it's impossible to prove a negative. But with good explanations and no real grounds to believe otherwise, why would you go to the conspiracy explanation? Zeke Hausfather again says this, Having worked with many of the scientists in question, I can say with certainty that there is no grand conspiracy to artificially warm the Earth. Rather, scientists are doing their best to interpret large data sets with numerous biases, such as station moves, instrument changes, time of observation changes, urban heat island biases, and other so-called inhomogeneities that have occurred over the last 150 years. Their methods may not be perfect and are certainly not immune from critical analysis, but that critical analysis should start out from a position of assuming good faith and with an understanding of what exactly has been done. For me, all the evidence I saw backed up that conclusion. I think there are plenty of lines of inquiry where the sceptical mindset might have some illuminating discussions on what is or is not going on with climate change. How accurate the forecasts are, what will happen in the future, is one. How reliable are accounts of similar changes that may have happened in the distant past, is another. And particularly what policy choices make sense given the range of possibilities. But the suggestion that routine and documented adjustments made to the climate data somehow constitutes fraud, everything I've seen suggests that that is nonsense. The smart critics I've seen with the most impressive arguments, none of them dispute that the data is correct, that the planet is warming. If the basis of your scepticism falls in the face of that reality, you really need to question where that leaves you and how it changes your relationship with the people who put up the charts and the graphs that appear to suggest otherwise.